So, Father, we thank you so much that you've given us the privilege of being here. We pray for those that are not here this morning. We pray you'll keep them safe, that you'll give them grace, that you'll heal them, uh, keep them safe down at Deer Club also. And we pray that you bring everybody back next week that we can all be together as our family again. We just thank you so much that you've given us the privilege of being here with our family. And that we all are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray that you'll help us to seek you out this morning, to seek out what is your will, what is your desire, and to go that direction. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 All right. We got a few courses we're going to do that's not in any book. We don't have them anywhere. So, but they're so easy that after you hear the first line, you can catch on. So y'all just sing with us. We're going to sing a little bit and just worship the Lord.
is almost yellow. That's some good stuff right there. Everybody good with that? Yeah. All right. Well, let's sing another one. Everybody know oh, the blood of Jesus? It's a carbon song. Carbon used to do this all the time. Y'all see me throw a rod this morning? Sometimes it happens. You get going real fast and you throw a rod because you ain't got enough oil in it.
number 197. We just got one song from the room. And uh, we got a very happy young lady here this morning. God answered the prayer for her. So we'll let her receive the offer this morning.
show them to them to be able to purchase the churches that they was able to get to, to do this meal. So, you know, they just said, let the church know, let everybody know how much they appreciate what our church was doing. So, you just know, I, I kind of expected them to be here this morning, but they might still be feeling better. <laughs> The one thing that God put on my heart, and I'd already talked to multiple people, and, and y'all had already showed, told me this is what you wanted. You wanted the money that comes to this church not to stay with them for us. Okay? What improvements do we have to do yet? You know, I don't take a salary. But the main thing is, can we be a blessing to somebody? Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. And so when we're blessing to other ministries, they don't, these ministries are not a church. They're just ministries on the street. Mm -hmm. So we're a church, we're not on the street. So now we have an extension. We have a street ministry, y'all. Mm -hmm. We're doing street ministry because we're partners with, min with ministries that are doing street ministry. We now are in street ministry. Absolutely. Thank God we're in street ministry. You know? And so we're able to help ministries that are in street ministry doing what we are we can't do within these four walls. And it's a great blessing for us to do that. Amen? Amen. All right, 197. We're going to slow it way down. And let's, let's sing this. Everybody sing this together. You got 197. We got four verses. Let's just, they're all the same word you ever heard. So once you see what the word is, just close your eyes. Just worship God. Thank you for what he's done and how good he is to us. We just don't realize how good God is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
worship you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Good job, Lord. Yeah, you have it.
because unless you're an avid Bible reader and you have read up on all the details, including the history, there's going to be things in there you're going to say, oh, I never read that. Well, it's in there, especially in the historical part of it, okay? If you look in the Jewish history and you look in the Greek history, they pulled from all of that, Greek history, Jewish history, the Christian history, and the word, the four Gospels, and they've written the script for the show. It's amazing. I've, I've, wa I've watched it three times now, and I can't get enough of it. And it's so good. It's such a blessing. So we're going to be doing that on Thursday night. It's going to be just a very short service. Each episode lasts between 45 minutes to an hour. And so I want you all to give me input on what you think the start time will be. Will it be a good start time? Because this is an outreach. We want, we're going to, again, put a sign up. We're going to have signs, come and see, chosen and we're going to be inviting people to come in. The reason why we're doing it on Thursday is because nobody has church service on Thursday night. Okay? We, are, we prayed about this and talked about it. Nobody has church service on Thursday night. So we can get some people in here that have been saying, hey, if y'all if y'all had a weeknight service, we'd come. Well, we're going to prove that. Okay? So we're going to invite people in. There's not going to be no preaching. We're going to watch a wonderful show, and, uh, and we're going to have prayer and go home. Now, I'm not telling them we're going to pray for the lost. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to pray the Holy Spirit into you. We're going to pray the blood of Jesus over you. We're going to pray, you know, so we're going to kind of do a sneak attack. But this that's what the, the midweek service is going to be, and they just launched their third season, so there's plenty of episodes for us to go for probably about six months doing this. And so we'll see how it goes, and, and you know, we'll, we'll just play it by ear. We'll let the Lord lead us. Does that sound good, everybody? Yeah. All right. Well, let's do this. Effective prayer. Has anybody taken the scriptures? Now, you don't have to raise your hand unless you want to. Have you taken these scriptures and applied them to your prayer life in the last two or three weeks? Has anybody seen a difference in your prayer life? Is this helping you? I'm seeing some nods. Okay, good, good. So here's what we've got. Now we're going to be getting into guidelines. We've talked about the Holy Spirit. Notice how I didn't try to cram the baptism of the Holy Spirit down your throats last week? Pretty good of me, ain't it? All right? We got a lot of people from a lot of different denominations. I'm not going to do that. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Do you take a gift and cram it somebody down somebody's throat? No, you do not. The Lord offers it to you. If you're interested, we're going to go further. Okay? And as the Holy Spirit leads me, we'll go further and teach you more about it. But it's not something that's going to keep you out of heaven if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It does make your journey here a whole lot easier, right? It's a lot easier with the Holy Spirit. Trust me. I flip people off a lot less since I got the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you. I'm, I'm a lot nicer person since I've got the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Lord is a lot better in me since I've got the Holy Spirit. So it's a lot easier to live right. So, But what we're going to do is today we're going to look at guidelines for prayer. You know, if you tell me the rules of the game, I can play the game right. And that's what God's doing. He, there are rules. There are guidelines for prayer. You pray wrong, the book of James tells us that. If you ask, you don't get it. Number one, you didn't ask. Number two, you didn't ask right. God's very specific about the way we're to pray. So right now, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have come into this time where we are here and we're hungry. We're hungry for the truth. We're hungry for the word. And we want to know how to pray like Jesus prayed. Jesus, we know that you have sent the Holy Spirit here to teach us. And Holy Spirit, we're asking you to manifest your spirit of wisdom and revelation in our hearts. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Fill us with the knowledge of your will. We pray that you will give us your ears to hear and your eyes to see as you hear and see. Help us to see ourselves and see our other, other people the way you see them and the way you see us. Give us your anointed mind to think your anointed thoughts. Give us your comprehensive heart so that we can comprehend the word and retain it as seed so that it will grow and become fruit that is well-pleasing to the Father. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Effective Prayer Heavenly Guidelines. We're looking at the top of the page. Ephesians 6.18 out of the Amplified says, Pray at all times. On every occasion, in every season, in cooperation with the Spirit. Doesn't mean you have to be praying in tongues if you're praying in the Spirit. With all manner of prayer and entreaty to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance 
interceding in behalf of all God's saints, God's consecrated people. Did anyone pray for the elections last week? Okay. Are you pleased with the way Georgia's elections turned out? We still got some work, don't we? But I'm telling you one thing. I saw God work in our elections. We had the smoothest election I've ever seen. It was very smooth. Yep. There was not two-hour lines. There was no shenanigans. Everything went smooth. Even the trouble spots had no trouble. Okay? So we were very blessed to have a good election. Our count came quickly. And even though we're in a runoff, we kind of were expecting that. Okay? So now we have the, the opportunity to go and vote again. Please do not stay home during this runoff. Pray and vote. Okay? We need to pray for the other states that haven't got their count in yet, that no shenanigans are taking place. Because we need God to work in other states as well. But notice, God did an amazing thing because there's a lot of states that used to have governors, Democratic governors, that now have Republican governors. God's working. So the Republican Party is not the end-all, be-all, but I'm going to tell you, when you're looking at politics, you have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's what politics is in the United States. You're not always going to have the one that's godly. You're going to have the one that's least evil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? And that's the way we have to look at it. A lot of churches don't look at it that way, and they're asinine in the way they look at politics. Okay? You have to look at politics through the eye of the word, and we have to understand that the lesser of two evils is sometimes the better choice because that's the only way we can choose. Now look at this. The next one down is 1 John 5, 14 through 15. It says this is the confidence. Everybody say confidence. confidence. We tried to do it. I got confidence this morning. didn't work. We'll have to practice on it. I like that Elvis Presley song. The assurance, the privilege, and boldness that we have in Jesus, in him. We are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to what? His will in agreement with his plan. He listens to and hears us. And since we know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted to us as our present possessions the request made of him. Notice last week, remember, we read this first person. Learn to read the word first person. You can say, and since I positively know that he listens to me, and whatever I ask, when I ask according to his will, I know that I have granted as my present possession the request I have made of him. Learn to read the word first tense. It'll help you. You make a confession of it. Now let's look at heavenly guidelines for prayer. We're going to be turning to some scriptures this morning. Matthew 6. Let's go there. They're all in the New Testament. They're all easy to find. Matthew 6. We're going to look at the heavenly Guideline of prayer that Jesus gave us during the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> verse 1. I'm going to read this out of the New Living. Watch out. Everybody say watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Heavenly Father. If you look at your notes, I printed out the New English translation. It says, be careful not to display your righteousness, merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Everybody say context. Okay. Now, here's the context of the whole next three subjects that you read in Matthew 6. Jesus said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. So you're looking at the three things that you're going to read in Matthew 6. So he's talking about giving, praying, and fasting. The subject of this chapter is don't do these things publicly to be admired by others. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Don't make a religion out of the way he says to do things. For example, go down to verse 5. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, 
who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then the Father, He sees everything, will reward you. Are we not supposed to pray in church together? Is it wrong for us to do that? No. Nope. No, not at all. He's not saying it's wrong for us to do that. He's saying the attitude. Yeah. The attitude of what we do matters to God. Now look at your notes. But that says verse 6. The effective prayer life is sincere and not pretentious. Everybody read the pink out loud. If a good deed is done with the wrong attitude, the goodness of the deed is negated. In God's mind, when you do a good deed to be seen of everybody, so everybody can see how great and wonderful you are, your good deed means absolutely nothing to him. Okay? That's why we are not to come in and make a show of what we do. We do our best, and, and any time again, I deflect all compliments to the Father. I appreciate the compliments, but I can't accept them. Because I ain't got nothing to do with it. It's all Him. Just like Jesus said, the words I speak are my Father's words. The power of the display of the power that you see, it's His power. Jesus walked in humility and he deflected everything back to his father. That's the way we're to approach prayer. We approach prayer with a deflected attitude. This is all about you. It got nothing to do with me. If anything good comes of this, it's because you did it. Okay? Because I'm going to do my best to pray according to the way you tell me to. But if anything good happens, it's going to be because you did it. It ain't because of me. Because I'm liable to mess it up. All right? So we have to have that attitude with God, especially when we do anything in public, but when we approach him in prayer, it's important because the Father's looking at our attitude that we come to him in prayer. Our attitude has always got to be, God, this is about you. It's not wrong to ask God for your needs, but if you're asking for your needs because it's about him, he's way more apt to answer that than you. Because you're trying to get your needs met for his benefit, not for yours. Okay? And this is where we have to be very cautious about worship. This is why we try to do worship the way we do, okay? Because a lot of times, how much do we make worship about us? When we come to church, if the song doesn't make you feel the right way, you don't react to it. Okay? And if you, especially, and, and, and I'm not knocking bigger little churches. The, the bigger churches have got it down, down pat. The bigger churches and little churches are easing into this too because they're learning it. There's an art of manipulation in worship. Because what they do is they sing songs that provide a emotional stimulus or stimuli. And it emotionally stimulates you into a form of worship. Okay? Because the song makes you what? Feel good. But it's not true worship. Because you're worshiping yourself rather than God. Because it's all the way about how you feel. If the song don't make you feel good, you don't react to it. If it makes you feel good, you react to it. And their worship leaders act for the reaction. Because they feed on the reaction. Make sense to everybody? It's no different than being in a rock concert. The more the fans cheer, the harder they play. Football players, the more the fans cheer, the harder they play. Worship leaders are the same way. The musicians are the same way. Because what we do is we're worshiping God out of our flesh rather than out of our soul. Our spirit. We've developed this form of worship throughout the years, not realizing we've done it. Think about in the book of Acts, when they went from house to house.
house to house, breaking bread and worshiping God, did they have stage lights? The smoke machines? Did they have all the instruments that we have? Nice sound system. Did they have all the right songs? No. Paul and Silas are sitting in the middle of the jail cell at midnight. They're in stocks, hands and feet in stocks. They have been beaten to the point of where their bones and their back are joined. They're sitting in feces and racks are falling on them. What did they do at midnight? They began to sing and praise God. They didn't have a band. You think they felt like singing? Were they in a mood to sing? No. But they said, we're going to worship God anyway because he's worthy, not because of the way I feel. Okay? Mm -hmm. But what we've done in the modern day church, all modern day churches, we have made it more about worship is about how we feel rather than how good God is. And because Paul and Silas worshipped the Lord in spirit and truth, what did God do for them? He broke the prison in half. He set an earthquake, broke the stocks, broke open all the doors, all every the whole jail just split apart, and everybody was free. He broke them out of jail. That's what true worship does. True worship breaks the chains that bind you. So right there, that tells me we come to the church all bound up because we're waiting for the right song to come along to make us feel like worshiping God. It ain't about us. It's about how good God is. True worship is always about Him. Well, prayer is the same way. Prayer is always about Him. And we have to understand the attitude that we have in prayer has got to be, this is about God, not me. Even though I'm apt to get my need met, it's still about Him. It's about how good He is. Everybody understand this? Yeah. So our attitude about church, our attitude about prayer, our attitude about worship, all of it, God pays attention to it. And that's why a lot of times we leave church and we don't, or we're not as fulfilled as we should be because we didn't have the right attitude in church. Because we made it more about us and the way we feel rather than about Him. And how much we honor him. I'm not trying to whip your tail, but I'm telling you what's, I asked Jesus to share with us what's on his heart. I had no idea he was going to say this. He's saying this. This is how he feels. He's explaining to us how he feels. Okay? So here's what we've got to do. We've got to make sure prayer has the right attitude. Now let's look at the next verse. It says verse 6, verse 7. When you pray, don't babble on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask. So what Jesus is talking about is, and the Pharisees would do this, and when you, when you watch the Chosen, you'll see this. They give it a good example of it. They would stand in the street, and they would, they would just pray the same prayer over and over and over and over and over and over. And they pray it loud and they would be very animated. And they would be in the middle of the public arena. And they would do it where people could see them. Because they believed that God was hearing them and was happy because they're just saying the same words over and over and over. And Jesus said, guess what? God ain't impressed. Okay? Are y'all still okay this morning? Have I hurt your feelings already? Okay, all right. So Jesus let us know that the Father is not impressed with that. Now go to the King James Version. We're going to go to the, next, the King James column. Verse 9. Read the first three, the first line with me together. Ready? Read. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Did Jesus say, repeat this prayer every time you pray? No. No, he didn't. The Lord's Prayer, we've made a religion or a habit of repeating the Lord's Prayer. Okay? He explained to us this is a guideline for prayer because he said after this manner, pray. Not pray this prayer. Everybody get it? Mm -hmm. After this manner, pray. Verse, look at the note in verse 8, bottom of your page. That's 
skipped over something. When Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites, our Father knows your need before you know your need. There's no use in trying to convince him that you have a need or that your need is urgent. He already knows your need. Flip the page. Manner. Manner means to pray after this manner, this form, this method, or this way of performing or executing prayer. So Jesus said, after this form, after this method, pray according this way. Don't just pray this prayer. Now he starts the prayer like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And if you follow your notes now, you're going to see each line of the prayer is in italics. So let's look at hallowed be thy name. We got a scripture, two scripture references. The first one is Isaiah 41 11 out of the Amplified. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. I refrain and do not utterly destroy you. Why should I permit my name to be polluted and profaned? Which it would be if the Lord completely destroyed his chosen people? Question mark. And I will not give my glory to another by permitting the worshipers of idols to triumph over you. God is sensitive about his name because his name is who he is. And when we speak the name of God, Jehovah, we should understand that he is God and nobody else is God. When we speak the name Jehovah Rapha, we know he's our healer. When we speak the name Jehovah Jireh, we know he's our provider. Okay? And so forth and so on. So God's very sensitive about guarding his name. Jesus said, when you pray, pray in God's name and understand what his name means. We're praying to the God that is so good, and he's so exceptionally good to me. Amen? Yes. Every day you need to be saying that. My God is so good, and he's so exceptionally good to me. Because we know that God, is, there's nobody that's better than God. Nobody can be more good than him. So we're praying to the God that is good, and God wants. Everybody say, God wants to, God wants to answer, my prayer. answer my prayer. But we have to pray according to his will and his way. We've got to pray after his manner. Okay, we've got to pattern our prayer after this prayer. Everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay, so we're addressing the Father when we pray. Can we only pray to the Father? Absolutely not. We can pray to Jesus. We pray the Holy Spirit, okay? But in general, we're addressing our prayer to the Father. Jesus prayed to the Father because he couldn't pray to himself. Everybody understand that? It would have been really weird if he's teaching his disciples and he's saying, now you pray and I'm going to show you how. I pray in the name of Jesus. It would be really weird if he prayed to himself. He didn't do that. He prayed to his father. Why? Because his father was the one that enabled him to do what he did. His father gave him his words. So now Jesus is on the throne. He's our high priest. We can pray to him. We can pray to the Father. Our Holy Spirit is with us. We can pray to him. All three of our God. Okay? So whoever you feel like you need to talk to, talk to them. They're not going to be insulted. Talk to all three of them. A lot of times I include them all three in there. Because I need help from all of them. Amen? Okay? So here's the thing. He's praying to the Father, but it's because... He is here on earth as a man. The Father's in heaven, and the Father is helping him. Now let's look at the next one. Psalms 115.1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for your mercy and loving kindness and for the sake of your truth and faithfulness. We are giving glory to God. One reason why I will have you and ask you to say, tell what God did for you, because what are you doing? You're giving a testimony. You're giving glory to God. This is what God did. Now, would it have been improper? She didn't, but would it have been improper if she'd have bounced and said, I did this and I did that and I passed this and I passed, and didn't give God glory for passing her GED? Would that have been improper? Yes, it would have. Because she wasn't including that the Lord did that for her. Make sense? But you, Alyssa came in and she praised God. She gave God glory for what he did. So we always have to deflect the glory to God. God did this. Okay? 
Everybody with me? All right. So let's go on. Now Jesus said, verse 10, says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now let's look at your notes. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Psalms 22 and 28 gives us a reference. For the what? Kingship. Say it again. Kingship. The kingship and the what? Kingdom. They're two different things. The kingship and the kingdom are the Lord's. He is the ruler over the nations. When you look at the word kingdom here in this prayer, and you go back to the original Greek and you follow it through to the original Hebrew, Jesus made a play on the word. He is saying kingdom and kingship. He's using them both. Because his kingship come. Well, the kingship is the king, right? And it's his authority. So what he's saying is, God, I'm praying on your authority. I'm praying in authority of the name of Jesus. We can now pray that in the name of Jesus. I'm praying in the authority of his name. I asked the Lord one day, I said, God, why don't we always end our prayer in the name of Jesus? It's just a habit. He said, I originally told you to do that because you're praying in his authority. You have the authority to pray this in his name, in his authority. Okay? So it's not just a habit to say it. We need to understand that we're ending our prayer in the name of Jesus because we're praying in his authority. He is the high priest sitting on the throne. He is a priestly king. And he is sitting on the throne of the universe, and we're praying in the authority in the name of Jesus. So when we pray, thy kingship come, we're asking for the authority of Jesus to be done in this situation. And then he said, thy will be done. Look at the next. In your notes, it says, thy will be done. Well, it says, go back up and look at 1 John 5, 14 through 15. It's at the top of your notes. What does it say? If you ask anything according to God's will, he hears you, and he will give you whatever you ask because you're asking according to his what? His will, his plan for your life. So we have to approach God knowing what his will is already. See, we've so many times we've just prayed, I don't know what God wants us to do in this, so let's just pray the Lord's Prayer. And we pray the Lord's Prayer and hope that we hit it right. That's like putting a blindfold on and playing darts. We don't want our prayers to be like we're blindfolded, praying darts, and hope that we get it. Okay? Everybody understand that? It's like the, the people who are praying the same prayer over and over and over again. You know what I see when I see that? I see that you're in Vegas and you're at the prayer slot machine and you just keep putting the coin in and pulling the handle hoping you're going to hit the jackpot that one day because you finally pray it enough times. Everybody get it? That's the way the world thinks. But when I approach God and I know his prayer, I know his will, and I come to him and I understand his will, I've already got the answer to my prayer. But I still have to ask because James said we don't have because we don't ask. So knowing his will, we still got to go ask. So we take his will to him and we show him his will in the word and say, Father, I found your will in this prayer. This is what I know you want. I'm asking you for this. And you promised me in 1 John that if I pray according to your will, you give it to me. So I expect it to happen. God loves that. Nothing thrills God anymore when you approach him that way. It's not proud. It's not haughty. It's confidence. That's confidence. Flip the page back to the start. Go to the top. This is the confidence, the assurance, the privilege of boldness that we have in him. We can be confident when we approach God. We can come boldly before the throne of God because we are sure that if we ask anything according to his will in agreement with his plan, he listens to us, he hears us, and since he does hear us, we have whatever we ask. Is that not what he said in the Word? So it's not improper. It's not haughty. It's not prideful. It's not hurtful to God for us to go before him with his word in hand and say, I found your will, Daddy. I know what your will is, and I'm asking you for this, and I expect to receive it. Thank you so much. There's nothing haughty or prideful about that at all. That's called operating in faith. And people that don't have faith call people who operate in faith haughty. 
They do. You're just prideful. You're just haughty. Well, no, it's just called faith. It'll do you to get something. Amen? Everybody with me? Faith is a slap in the face to people who are living in doubt. It really is. I've, I've encountered it. Argue with me all day long. I, I, I love you, but i got better things to do. Because I know what God said, and I'm standing on what he said. Amen? The only one thing I can depend on is what God said. I can depend on that. All right? You ready to go on the next one? Let's go. All right. It says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We have studied that scripture for the longest. Look at your notes. In earth as it is in heaven, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, declare to be unlawful on earth, must be what is already loosed in heaven. We are praying heaven onto earth. Is that simple? We've been studying that scripture for the longest because it's the keys of the kingdom. And Jesus gave us the prayer to make it happen. We pattern our prayers after this prayer, and we're going to make heaven come down to earth. In this little girl right here, we're praying heaven into her body. Do you think that her lungs would be undeveloped in heaven? No, they wouldn't. Would there be any infection in her body in heaven? Absolutely not. Would there be any premature or lack of ability in heaven? Absolutely not. We can pray heaven into this precious little child. Because it's his will. That's his will. Okay? And we can pray that the parents are lifted up. Because right now they're struggling too. You don't ever want to see your youngins hurt. Especially when they're innocent like that. You know? So we've got to help them pray. Alright. Look at verse 11. Still reading King James. This is where, unfortunately, we've got to spend a little time. Give us this day our what? Daily, Daily bread. Boy, do we mix, mix it up. Do we, do we get hung up? I can't even say it. Don't we get hung up when we pray this? Look at your notes. Give us this day our daily bread. Go, hang, keep, your, keep a marker in Matthew 6. Let's go to John, St. John. Chapter 6, about three, it's exactly three books over to your right. John chapter 6. Not 1 John in the back of the Bible, but St. John. John chapter 26, excuse me, 6. We start at verse 22. We're not going to read all the way through 71. In your study time, take it home and read all the way through 71. John 6, 22. Is everybody there? Say amen. amen. If you're not there, say hold up. Was that a hold up? All right. You're close. There you go. John 6, 22. I'm going to read out the New Living. The next day the crowd had stayed on the far shore, saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. This is right after the, the uh, miracle of the five loaves and the two, two, two fishes. So he fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fishes. All right, so all these folks that had eaten, they hung out waiting for what? The next meal. Okay? So Jesus left in the middle of the night. He scooted out without them seeing him. Matter of fact, he walked on the water to rescue the disciples while the storm was going on. So this is the next day. Verse 24. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. Verse 25. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I what? I what? I gave you the free meal. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? 
Now, when they say we want to perform God's works too, what should we do? What work do you think they're talking about? Say it again. How can we get the free bread to keep happening for us? Okay? Verse 29, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Well, they didn't like that answer. Verse 30, they answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, after all, verse 31, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Can you see this? Can you sense this? Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. They are pulling the same satanic manipulation on Jesus that, that Satan pulled on him during his time of being tempted. It's the same concept. If you be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are who you say are, give us the free meal. They're trying to manipulate Jesus because they're thinking fleshly. This again shows us where prayer is not. When Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, he wasn't talking about food for you to put in your mouth. That's not what he's talking about at all. Because if that had been the case, Jesus has said, oh, sure, no problem. Here you go. Bread's popping out everywhere. Bacon, eggs, coming up out of the rocks. You know? Dip up a bucket of seawater and there's coffee. <laughs> come back tomorrow. Uh, come back this afternoon and I'll give you some pork chops on the menu. That's not the way Jesus operated. That's not the way we're supposed to treat prayer. Prayer is not our Christmas list like we give to Sandy Claus. Okay? But in the flesh, people who pray in the flesh, people who are fleshly minded, they're constantly praying according to the needs of their flesh. And this is where Jesus wants us to understand. He's not talking about give us this day our daily bread so I can put stuff in your mouth. He's talking about a specific bread. Let's read on. Verse 32. I'll tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34. They said, sir, give us that bread every day. They're still thinking fleshly. They're still thinking loaves and fishes. Jesus replied, I am. Everybody say, I am. The bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, though you have seen me. Verse 38. Skip. Now go to 37. We'll keep going. However, those the Father's given me will come to me. He, I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me not to do my own will. What did he say in the prayer? Father, not my will, but yours be done. Thy kingdom come, thy kingship come, thy authority, thy will be done, not mine. That's the prayer. Verse 39, and this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me, but I should raise him up at the last day. Verse 40, for it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up in the last day. Then a people began to murmur in disagreement because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, stop complaining. Everybody say, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day I will raise them up. And as, it, as it is written in the scripture, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to who? Jesus, me. So the, the Father is drawing people to Jesus and opening their eyes. Now look at verse 46. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who was sent from God. 
Now, verse 47. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am. Everybody say, I am. Mm -hmm. The bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all what? Yeah. They died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. Say, I will never die. I will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I offer so the world may live is what? Say it again. Now, every Sunday, what do we do? Take communion. We take communion. What is the bread? It's his flesh. Now, he said that the, uh, he said, the bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. John 1, don't turn. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made what? And He walked among us. Okay? The Word is the flesh. The flesh is the Word. When we receive communion... We're standing here at the altar together in agreement saying, I receive what I have heard, and I believe it, and I accept it, I agree with it. I'm taking it into my spirit. And we do that by receiving communion. Because it is the covenant meal. The covenant meal is when two people join together in covenant, and they said, we're coming together in agreement, and we're going to work together as partners, and they took the covenant meal, which I'm holding in my hand right here. We still do it in weddings today. You just don't realize it. When the bride and groom cut the cake, they pull out a piece of cake, and they have it in their hands, and the bride feeds the groom, the groom feeds the bride, it's the bread. When they drink the drink together, it's the wine. It's the covenant meal. Everybody understand this? Because you're joining together as one. When we take communion with Jesus, His Spirit joins with our spirit, His Word joins with our spirit, and we're receiving Him into us. And this is the finality of the Sunday morning service that says, I stand in agreement with this, I accept it, and I'm bringing it into my spirit as part of me. What I've heard. That way it'll grow, and it'll prosper, and it'll make fruit in your life. Does everybody get this? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a hint. You read the Word, you spend your time with God in the Word, get you some communion. Take communion at the end of your prayer time and your study time with God. You don't have to have me to serve you communion. Take you a little cracker, take you some grape juice, and take communion. Jesus, the bread is your body. I received this, what I've just read. I stand in agreement with it. The wine, it is your blood. I receive it. I stand in agreement with it. We are one. Your Word and I are one. Do it every time. I take communion almost every single day of my life. Don't make me any better than you. It's just a discipline God taught me. But that's the reason why he gives me the revelation he does. Amen? Mm -hmm. And you are supposed to be doing this too. You receive revelation when you read. Take it and take communion. Do it. <laughs> It'll change your life. <laughs> Amen? Mm -hmm. Be bold with God. I received this in the name of Jesus. Believe it or not, it'll start working in your body. Some of the stuff you've been struggling with in your body, I can tell a difference in what he's done in my body. Amen? Y'all will get it. Hang on. Put your seatbelts on. It'll be all right. All right. Verse 53. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person up at the last day. Notice he's having to repeat it over and over again. Verse 55. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh, which is the word, drinks my blood, which is the spirit, remains in me and I in him. Everybody get that? If you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you remain in Jesus and I in him. Now, turn to John chapter 15. Go a few pages over. 
to John 15. Look at verse 1. John 15, 1, New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce what? Fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear what? Fruit. So they will produce even more what? Mm -hmm. It's all about the fruit, ain't it? You have already been pruned and purified by the message or the word that I have given you. Read it out loud with me. Everybody read. Remain in me and I will remain in you. How do we remain in him? We eat his flesh, we drink his blood. That's how we remain. What is the flesh? The word. What is the blood? The spirit. We're receiving the, the word and the spirit of God. Every Sunday when you're hearing this, you're receiving in your spirit the word of God and the spirit of God. You're hearing it, you're receiving it. If you accept it as truth, it's getting sown down into your spirit. That's your life. That's how you remain in Him. You sit at home and you take open your Bible and you read it. You're receiving the Word, His flesh, and His Spirit, His blood, in you every time you break open your Bible and you read it. That's how you remain in Him. People who break open their Bible once a week just at church on Sunday, and now most of them don't because they got it up on the screen so they don't even bother carrying their Bible to church anymore. Could you live on one sandwich a week? Most Christians do. One sandwich a week. It ain't no wonder when they pray, go nothing happen. Amen. Because they're not remaining in him. But what did God say he's going to do to the ones that ain't fruitful? Come on. He said, I'll prove the ones that are fruitful. We're going to be pruned. Okay? We're pruned every time we read the word. Have you been, don't raise your hand. You give me a nod. Have you been convicted of anything yet this morning that you need to correct in your life? Guess what that is? That's the pruning. He's pruning. Okay? If something that the Lord has said through these lips has convicted you and said, oh, I need to correct that, that's a pruning. He's pruning you. Why? Because he wants you to bring more fruit. Everybody get it? He wants more fruit. And he knows if he prunes the dead wood off of you, every place he prunes dead wood, that's going to what? Make some fruit. There'll be a bloom there. All the dead wood he's got to prune off of us. That's what the word does. That's why it's the sword of the spirit. It cuts. If you don't get cut every Sunday, there's something wrong with your preacher. Amen? Because God's got to prune the dead wood off. Y'all still love me, right? Okay. I know mama does. <laughs> She'd love me if I sum up here and just spoke the national anthem. All right. Is everybody getting something out of this? Okay. Verse 5. Uh, verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit of itself if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for what? Anything. Say it again. Anything. Now here's the key. How do we have an effective prayer life? He's just telling us right here. We pattern our prayers after the prayer pattern Jesus gave us, and we have to remain in him. He said, if you remain in me and my what? Words remain in you. Now he gets plain about it. My words, the bread, the flesh. If they remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciple. This brings great glory to my Father. Now, asking Him for anything we want is a blank check, isn't it? 
But how does he know we're not going to ask for something that's of the flesh? Because of the word. Because he said, if my words remain in you, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you will be able to ask whatever you want because the word is going to show you what you want. Everybody say this with me. I want, I want to want, want what Jesus want wants want me, me to, want. to want. Pray that every day. Jesus, help me to want to want what you want me to want. Pray it every day. And he will guide you in the word of what he wants. And then you can ask for that. And you know you're going to get it. Everybody understand that? But a lot of times we ask for things we think we want. But we don't want it once we get it. We're asking God, give me this. Oh, Lord, I want this. Please give me that. And then soon as he, well, three months later, God, get this out of my life. I, did. I wish I had to ask for it. Oh, God, please. Anybody know where I'm coming from? Okay? We've got to make sure that we ask God according to his word. Because if we do, we'll never have something we don't want. Now, go to Matthew, back to Matthew 6. Where the Lord's Prayer is. When you get to Matthew 6, go down to the bottom of Matthew 6. Verse 24. We're still on, give us this day our daily bread. Verse 24, New Living, no one can serve to what? Okay. For you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and what? Mm -hmm. That means you ain't supposed to have money, but who do you serve? What does the word serve mean? Thy kingship come, thy will be done. That's who I serve. I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's my will for his will to be done in my life. So I'm serving him. I'm asking according to his will, not mine. You know why I never pray to win the lottery? Because I don't play it. <laughs> but if I did play it, and I won it, it would be a what? It would be a curse. If you don't know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing and you know how to prepare for it and you make all the legal preparations and you have all the people you can trust, you can turn that into a blessing. But most people are like, Woo! and then what? A year later, they're broke. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it was a curse. Okay? Now, let's look at what he says now. Verse 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Now, he's talking about you can't serve two masters. So who do you serve? Okay? You either serve God or you serve your everyday needs. He said, give us this day our daily what? He's not talking about your daily needs of food, clothing, and shelter. That's not what he's talking about. We found out he's talking about what? The Word and the Spirit. That's what he's talking about. So now we're looking at this. He said, you can't serve two masters. You're going to hate one, love the other. You're going to be devoted to one, despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? How many of you feed the birds on a regular basis? Why do you do that? It's expensive. Are they helping you? Are they working for you to help pay for that bird seed? Do the birds stand on the bird feeder and wring their hands, hoping that they're going to get to eat today? No, they don't. They just show up because food's there. Amen? I've never seen a bird check in his 401k. No. There's nothing wrong with having a 401k. I'm just being facetious about it, just like Jesus is. Jesus is saying the birds don't store up in barns. 
You don't see them storing up. They ain't got a little bird barn that they're putting all their stuff in. Amen? Why? Because they're trusting God to take care of them day by day. So what do the birds do? Tweet. <laughs> they're on Twitter tweeting all the time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Okay? Let's go on. Verse 27. Excuse me, verse 26. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest store food. Your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Say, I am more valuable, I'm more valuable. To, God to God than the birds. Than the birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? No, it'll actually take moments from your life. Verse 28. Why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon and all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. If God so cares, if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he certainly care for you? Why do you have so little what? Mm -hmm. Where does faith come from? Hearing the word. So what's more important, a biscuit or the scripture? If you get the word in your heart, you'll get a biscuit. God will make you a biscuit. He'll provide one. The most important thing is the word. Word first. Everybody say word, word first. Word first. 31. So don't worry about these things saying. Notice how we worry. We worry by what? Saying it. Don't worry by saying. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? You're going to have a lot of thoughts come through your mind. Don't verbalize thoughts of worry. Don't say it. These things dominate the thoughts of who? This verse 32. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Notice we don't have to spend any time in our prayer life convincing God we have a need. How much time have we wasted in prayer before this trying to convince God that we have a need and that he really should take care of that for us? Think about it. Because we didn't know anybody. We don't have to convince God that we have a need. He knew you had a need before you come to him. He knew what you were going to ask for. He knew what you were thinking about. He knew the emergency was going to happen before it happened to When you brought it to God, what first time he found out about it? Amen? This is what he says, verse 33. Read it out loud with me. Everybody read it. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Boy, that's really simple, ain't it? So if you need a biscuit and you don't have anything to make a biscuit out of, what should you do first? Get in the word. Find where the word supplies the needs for the bread. And he'll take care of you. Amen. He might give you $10 and say go to Long Street. Yeah. Okay. Because they got good biscuits. Didn't even have to make a mess to make it. It's a messy thing to make a biscuit, ain't it? Yeah. Okay. Now, does everybody understand? Does everybody understand what Jesus is talking about when he says, Father, give us this day our daily bread? What's the first thing he's talking about? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. Yeah. So when you pray that, you're praying that He will give you understanding in the Word. You're going to understand what you read, and it's going to be planted deep in you, and it's going to provide the fruit that you need. It'll produce the bread. It'll produce the money to pay the bills. It'll produce everything you need. That's what He's trying to say. Everybody understand this? Yeah. Okay. Are you still with me? Everybody still here? Okay, verse 12. Let's go back up to Matthew 6, verse 12. So, Jesus said, After this manner pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and what? Forgive us our debts, as we what? Forgive our debtors. Now, if you look at your notes, verse 12 says, Forgive us as we forgive others. 
Matthew 6, 14 through 15, out of the Amplified. For if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not telling them you forgive them and then reminding them of it every time you see it. Mm -hmm. That ain't forgiveness. Yeah. I love the way the Amplified explains forgiveness. Forgiveness is this. You leave them, let them go, and give up all resentment. Has anybody ever owed you money? If somebody's owed you money, then you know what it's like to have resentment. Because that's one of the hardest things to forgive. And when God says just forgive them of it, you have to forgive them and let it go and never bring the money up again. And never treat them like they owe you any money ever again. That's forgiveness. Y'all got real quiet on that one. That's what God does. Does God bring up your past to you every day? If you bring it up to Him, He says, what are you talking about? Why? Well, because He said it's been cleansed as if it never happened by what? The blood of Jesus. So a lot of things, a lot of times our prayers are hindered because we're still harboring resentment and don't realize it. And a lot of times we have some resentment built up, some bitterness built up towards somebody that's done us wrong. Might not even know. I'm going to tell you what I had to do. I had to ask God to help me and forgive me for harboring resentment towards the Democrats. I did. Back in 2020. I had to ask God to please forgive me or harboring resentment against the Democrats. Because of what they did to our nation. Amen? And I've had to walk in that forgiveness very carefully. Because there are times when I want to build it back up and then go back and nope. God said, you forgive them. Because why? They don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They're blinded to the point of stupidity. Because Satan is coming and blinded the minds of the world. And they call right, wrong, and wrong, right. That's stupidity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? And he had to help me understand that. They're making decisions based on what they believe and what they think because they're blinded by Satan. So I expect them to do what they do. I expect them to, to vote the way they vote, act the way they act. I expect our pres present president to do what he's doing. I expect it. It don't surprise me at all. And I have to say daily, constantly, God, I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. But God, please help them. Open their eyes to the truth. Help them to see the truth. Put light in their heart and help them to see the error of their ways. Help them to see the mistakes of them. God, help them. Because you helped me. We can all say that. Mm -hmm. Can you? Mm -hmm. God, you helped me. So please help them. Everybody still okay? Mm -hmm. And if we have that approach to prayer... Our prayers will go through without any hindrance. Because unforgiveness will hinder our prayers. All right? Let's finish this up. Verse 13. The next thing he says is lead us not into temptation. Now this is something that God expanded this morning because I wasn't going to do this. But he said, son, somebody needs this. I said, okay. So lead us not into temptation. Look at the bottom of your notes. James 1, 12 through 18. Let's, let's go to, I'm sorry, let's go to James 1, 12, 18. Go to the back of your Bible. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 12 through 18. Everybody there say amen. amen. All right. I'm going to read it out of New Living. God bless.
Blessed is those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, do not say what? God is tempting me. Do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he what? Say it out loud. Never he never tempts anyone else. So did God tempt you to do wrong? No, he did not. Then he goes on to explain where temptation comes from. This is the part we don't, we really wish we didn't have to read. Temptation comes from what? Our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to what? Death. Death, Death is separation from life source, which is, means it separates you from God. Now this is where temptation comes from. We blame the devil for temptation, and he's part of it. But temptation, the root of it, happens from our own desires. Or else Satan wouldn't have any reason to tempt us. Because he sees where our desires lie. And if he sees where our desires lie, then he knows he can tempt you right there in that point right there. Because that's where your lust is. That's a good spot right there. Let's throw some temptation at him. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. But God didn't do it. Everybody say, God didn't do it. Didn't do it. Now go back to Matthew. Go back where we were in Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 6. Everybody back at Matthew chapter 6? Back up to Matthew chapter 4 now. Before we read Matthew chapter 4, look at the bottom of the page. The bottom of the page of your notes says, Lead us not into temptation. Read the black note with me. Read the black and the red. Everybody ready? Read. Since God does not tempt us, he would never lead us into temptation. So the correct wording would be lead us out of temptation. I'm not saying Jesus said it wrong. I'm saying it was interpreted wrong. It was actually interpreted wrong. Now I can give you three witnesses that explain that. Okay? First of all, we read in James for us never to say that God tempts us. So if God doesn't tempt us, will God lead us into a place of temptation? No, no he won't. He wouldn't lead us there to be tempted. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Reading out of the King James. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to what? Uh-oh, do we have a contradiction in the word? Absolutely not. It's impossible. There are no contradictions. Okay. Look at the New Living. Then was Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. It still says the same thing. Boy, are we in trouble. Now, wait a minute. Look at your notes. Flip your notes over to page 3. Let's look at Mark. It's on your notes. Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Tells the same story. Mark chapter 1, 12 and 13 says, The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. Does it say he, he led him there to be tempted? No, it does not. He led him there, and he was tempted there. Everybody understand this? Look at the next one. Luke 4, 1 and 2, his account of it. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days and nights. Jesus ate nothing at that time and became very hungry. Now what they're doing is they're leading us into the obvious of what the Holy Spirit was doing. 
Go look at, look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. And I'm going to write in here with my words because he was about to be tempted of the devil. And read the next verse with me. Everybody ready? Read. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward was a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, when did the devil come to tempt Jesus? After the 40-day period of fasting. Everybody understand this? So here's the, let me give you the chronological happening. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus when he come up out of the water when he was baptized. Then the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness because the Holy Spirit knew by the determination of the Father that Satan was going to come to tempt Jesus. The time of temptation was coming. So the Holy Spirit said, we've got to go to the wilderness to what? Prepare for the temptation. How did he prepare him for the temptation? Forty days of what? Fasting. He fasted and prayed for 40 days. When you fast for 40 days, something amazing happens. The first four or five days, your hunger is ridiculous. Your stomach's just like you are right now, wishing I'd hurry up and get done so you can go eat. Your stomach is turning over and over saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. After the fifth day, it stops. It's amazing. Do you know why it stops? Because it begins consuming your body. Your body starts consuming itself. All of your excess fat begins to burn. Once that burns up, then it begins consuming excess muscle. It'll begin consuming your muscles. Okay? When you get to about day 38 to 39, the hunger pains then return. Why? Because it has expended all the muscle tissue it can afford to eat. Now it's about to start getting into critical mass. The critical mass of your muscles, your vital organs, your brain tissue, all these things. It's beginning to start to consume them. So the hunger pains come back. And they come back with a vengeance. Your body's saying, hey, we got to eat now because if we don't, we're going to start e eating the stuff that matters. Everybody with me? Yeah. That's when Satan came to tempt Jesus. At that moment. And what did he tempt him with first? If you be the Son of God, he tempted him with his identity first. Every one of his temptations was to prove you're the Son of God. If you be the Son of God, now what? Turn these stones into bread. Don't you know the body was saying, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do it. Of course it was. But what did Jesus do? He pulled out the sword, and he busted the devil upside the mouth with the sword of the Spirit, and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. What was the critical mistake that Satan made? He believed that when Jesus was at his weakest point, that he was devil baited. But what does the scripture tell us? When we are weak, that's the point. When we are what? Say it again. The strongest. When our flesh is the weakest, our spirit is the strongest. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to prepare him for that temptation. That's why Jesus said, Father, lead us out of temptation. Prepare us for the time of temptation and lead us out of it. So we don't fall to temptation. That's the way you pray. Because the Father would never lead you into temptation. Does everybody get this? So Luke and Mark, it was written correctly. I'm not saying Matthew got it wrong. But when they, in, when they translated Matthew's version of it, they didn't translate it exactly right. Because it goes against what Luke and Mark said. And it goes against what James said. Does everybody get this? By the mouth of two or three witnesses, what? Let every word be confirmed. Now, here's what we got to do. We got to stop. Because y'all are full. Can't go any further. It'd be useless. Okay? Y'all are full up. God said, 
that we had to get to this point. This morning was very critical that we get to this point. Because there's a time coming. I'm not trying to scare you and be theatrical or anything like that. But the time's coming. We're going to, we may take up the rest of this next week. I'm not sure. But take it home and study it. Take it home and study it. It'll help you. Let's come to the altar. Gone as far as I can go.